uh, what we're going to dig into is, of course, objections. So uh, if you came to this webinar, you're probably wondering, hey, you know, I'm getting some objections, whether that be through email or over the phone we're going to talk about today. And what do I do in those cases? And a lot of times what I hear, and let me know as we're going through this, you guys in the chat, if, if you relate with any of this. But oftentimes what I hear is this, hey, when I get an objection, I feel like I kind of lose control of the conversation. You know, so if I'm cold calling someone and the prospects is not interested, I feel like I kind of lost control of the situation. And like, what am I supposed to do? That doesn't feel very good. A lot of times what I hear too is, oh, if they say something to me, like they're using one of my competitors or, you know, they're looking into another solution already and they've almost like hired someone. I got that re objection recently. Like I might get put on the spot. I might not know how to respond. Oh, is, it, is the screen share not working you guys? Let me know. Kyra said that the screen share here isn't showing. Is anyone else having issues seeing the screen? Let me know in the chat. Okay, here, let me reshare. Thank you for letting me know you guys. I'm having a little bit of troubles with Zoom here lately. Okay, what about now? Let me know in the chat. Can you see it now? Okay, cool. Thank you, you guys. A little, little bit of tough technical difficulties there. So uh, yeah, being put on the spot is something that I hear a lot of people say. Um, I don't know about you, but have you ever read a, you know, a book or heard a podcast or maybe you see in a LinkedIn post and they said, hey, use these magic words or phrases and uh, it wasn't working. It's like some sort of gypsy magic. Like, hey, it's supposed to work if you say these exact same kind of things and it isn't working, right? I run into that a lot. I hear that. And a lot of what I hear too is uh, rejection. Hey, um, when I get objections that I don't know how to handle, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the last thing I want to do is have the prospect like shut me down. So what I want to talk to you guys about today is a way to handle these objections. And I actually call it deflating objections. And I'll talk about where that comes from here in a second. But I want to show you guys a way to handle these objections in a way that doesn't feel spammy or salesy. Uh, I want to talk to you about how you can actually use objections to build meaningful connections. Um, how you can use something that's like a repeatable framework but doesn't sound scripted and doesn't require you to say specific words or phrases. I'm going to give you some suggestions and things like that that you can say, but it's going to be repeatable. The focus to, is not to be scripted. And what I'm going to talk about today too is, and I always like to use Beyonce as an example, but put any you know, lead singer of your favorite band or whoever, like that confidence that they radiate on stage. That's what I want to uh, share with you guys today is a system that you can use to feel confident handling objections. Um, so I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat. Um, how many meeting opportunities do you feel like you're losing every month because you get objections that you don't know how to handle? Let me know. It could be a percentage. It could be a number of meetings. How many meetings do you feel like you're personally losing? Cool. Two to three, 10 to 15. And Luke, you said there are some panels covering the screen share. Are you guys still having issues with the screen share here? Do you see the slides in here? Is there something covering it? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, we got Dale says too many. Joe says three to four. Yeah, two boxes covering images. It's supposed to be a black square here. Let me try one more time, you guys. I appreciate your guys' patience here. Let me... Try this one more time here. I'm having a heck of a time with, with uh, Zoom here. All right. How are we looking now? <laughs> Looks good. <laughs> you guys are such troopers. I appreciate you doing this. It's always uh, fun to have technical difficulties in front of hundreds of uh, people that are, that are watching you. So... Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you for bearing with me here. Um, yeah, so so kind of back to my question. I had a few people respond, it looks like. Um, you know, Judith feels like she's missing out on three to four meetings uh, per month. Uh, Gretchen says a handful. Joe says three to four. Dale says too many. You know, how many meetings do you feel like uh, you are missing out on per month because you don't know how to handle 
some of those objections. Let me know in the chat. I'll give you guys a second here. Yeah, Lisa says two or three. Yeah, five to ten. That's a lot. Yeah, five to ten. That's 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 a that's a big missed opportunity there. Uh, Kyra says most of the people that respond back have objections that are hard to overcome lately. Could be a territory thing. Yeah, we're definitely going to get into that. So it sounds like for a lot of you, you feel like there's potentially an opportunity here that you're missing out on by not being able to handle some of these objections. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, one, uh, the psychology behind what's going on. We're not going to spend too much time talking about the psychology, but we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, I want to give you some frameworks for handling uh, your toughest objections. And it sounds like one of the black boxes. Did the black box disappear, Mindy? Let me know. Yes. Okay, man, this is this is great. So I can't even put anything over the screen. So I'm totally winging the chat and kind of looking uh, elsewhere. So <laughs> fun. Uh, so yeah, what do you think is with people's rudeness these days, Jackass? We're definitely going to get to that. So the last thing I'm going to talk to you about too, if you've been on these last couple webinars too, is how to get more support. Uh, so one of the things that we're running right now is a prospecting boot camp. I'm going to save the last 10 minutes of the call to talk about that. And if you don't want to hear about it, all good. You can hop off at the end of that call. But I'm going to give you some really actionable stuff today. And if you want to get more help around other things related to objections around maybe your emails or your cold calls or whatever it might be, um, I'm going to help you with that stuff too. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys relate with Joel here. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Joel said in, in our boot camps when he came in was that, um, is anyone here, uh, let me know, just put a Y in the chat. Does anyone here get objections from people that are like really experienced? So they might be 20, 10, 20 years your senior, very experienced. And if you're like Joel here, just, you know, maybe you're a few years into the job or maybe you have less experience than the people you're reaching out to. And it's kind of intimidating to get those objections. <laughs> Midi says yes in all caps. Yeah, we got a couple of whys. Um, yeah, so Joel was in a very similar spot. Um, and he's just into his uh, first job as a BDR uh, here in the, in the first couple of years. So some of these frameworks really helped him feel more confident. Um, and these work, by the way, no matter how senior you are. So you could be selling for 30 years and a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you today uh, work as well. Yeah, so some people say, hey, no. Usually some senior people. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's get to work. So let me share. And then we might have another surprise here. Let's see if uh, let's see if this works today as well. Okay, so let me share my desktop. All right, cool. Can you guys go ahead and just give me a quick let me know in the chat? Is this working as well? Can you guys see a worksheet and my hand moving over the worksheet? It says five desires? Yeah. Okay, cool. This is awesome. Okay, so what we're going to talk about here is uh, these are like five mental barriers that people have. These are mental blocks that people have around objection handling. And what I want to do is talk about some of the psychology that you need to have your head wrapped around the approach. And then we'll dig into some of the more tactical stuff on how to handle those objections. So one of the first things that I see is, and I alluded to this earlier, is oftentimes this mental block we have in sales is that if we give the prospect a choice, if we allow them to say no, well, they could say no, <laughs> right? So if we give them the freedom instead of like, kind of like being assumptive and telling them what to do, so to speak, if we give them a choice to say yes or no, like, can't they say no? I hear that a lot. And a lot of what this stems from is autonomy. So one of the things that we actually need to do when we're approaching objection handling, especially in anything prospecting related is if we actually give the prospect autonomy and we allow them to have a choice, especially when we're objection handling, it seems counterintuitive, but they're actually a lot more likely to listen to us. And it's a lot more likely to disarm them if, we, if they feel like they have a choice. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we can ask for permission. And really like handle the objection in a way that they feel open to by asking them for permission. So we're going to say words and phrases and, and things that kind of sound like this. Um, hey, would it be a bad idea if I shared a little bit more about how we're helping other companies like A, B, and C overcome that same problem? 
or hey, would it be cool to share with you uh, just some of the insights that we're finding from working with other companies like yours? And then if it's not helpful for you, um, you know, we can go ahead and hang up the phone. Right, we're going to give them a choice. And I'm going to walk through some of the more specifics uh, here in a second. But if we ask for permission and make it permission-based and allow them to have a choice, we're actually much more likely to get what we want. The second desire uh, has to do with this uh, mental block of if we get someone on the phone and they give us an objection, I don't know if you guys have ever felt this before, do, but do you ever feel sometimes like, you know what, like I need to make sure I talk about what we do because if I don't talk about what we do, like they're not going to understand and they could say not interested. So I have very little time on the phone, especially. So I got to talk about what I do. Otherwise, I might not get an opportunity. And what we need to do is actually the exact opposite of that, right? So the next of the five desires is your prospect has a desire to feel understood. So what we actually want to do is start with empathy, not what you need. So if we can acknowledge the prospect when they share a concern with us or they say, hey, you know, we're already using another provider or, hey, we're using one of your competitors. If we actually acknowledge that first and say something like, hey, sounds like you're already taken care of. I imagine what you're wondering is like, you know, why would you want to even entertain another solution that could possibly disrupt the system that you have in place right now? If we can acknowledge their objection and empathize with them first, it's actually going to have this cool disarming effect. And it's going to make them feel understood. So as much as you might feel inclined to like really come in and talk about you and your stuff because you feel like you have such a short window to do, we just need to slow down a little bit and talk to them and make sure they feel understood. So the third part is your prospect has a desire to be the hero. So a lot of times when we talk about our solution, we come in and talk about how we are such badasses or our solution is so awesome or we're the number one rated software on g2.com. So desire to be the hero is we want the prospect to feel like the hero. We want to talk about how we help people like them win. So we want to be Alfred. We want to be Robin. We want the prospect to feel like Batman. So we need to make the prospect the hero. So when we're prospecting, uh, a lot of the ways that I like to think about this is you're advocating on your past customers or current customers. You're advocating on their behalf. All you're doing is sharing the ways that your current customers and past customers are winning. And Lydia asks, yeah, I'm just wondering if I might be more effective to say, hey, would it be a good idea too? Because we want to guess where I feel like asking, would it be a bad idea to blank? Let's them say yes and shut you down right there. Um, yeah, Lydia, uh, hold that question. We're definitely going to get to that when we go a little bit more into like the responses. And just so you guys know too, I forgot to mention this, but there is a Q&A button uh, in Zoom. If you guys have questions, um, I want to make sure to get to as many of them as I can. So please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, Lydia, if you could drop that into the Q&A, I want to make sure to get, get an answer to your question if we have time, okay? All right, so let's keep going. So the other thing too is... Um, and this is actually pretty personal to me. One of the other things too, that can be a big mental block in sales. I don't know if any of you have ever felt like this before, but um, I, I'm half Chinese and half white. And one of the things that uh, I experienced growing up, especially in elementary school is, uh, you know, I went to a town of 5,000 people. That's, that's where I grew up in. And I was like, basically one of like maybe three Asian kids, <laughs> you know, in the entire school. Um, so what I tried to do is I tried to blend in so I felt very out of place. I wanted to be more like everyone else because what I saw in media was, you know, honestly, it's like people that didn't look like me. Uh, Jackie Chan was <laughs> and Jet Li were the only people I saw in media that like looked like me. So what I tried to do was blend in. And in sales, oftentimes we can do that too, where we feel like the safer thing to do is handle those objections or prospect the way that other salespeople prospect and kind of blend in because it feels like taking a risk if we do something too different. 
So where this comes in with prospecting and especially objection handling is that your prospects have a desire for novelty. And this is where pattern interruption comes in, right? So a lot of what I'm gonna show you today has to do with like, how do we interrupt our prospects pattern? So how do we respond in a different way than they're used to hearing when they get objections? All right, so Jack asked a really great question. I'm looking at your question here, Jack. Uh, shouldn't we be very careful about asking yes or no questions? Yeah, so when we're objection handling, I'm gonna talk through uh, several different types of examples, Jack. But by asking yes or no questions that are a little bit more pointed, um, we can get a banter back and forth with the prospect and then we can dig in a little bit deeper. So in other words, if we ask a really deep open-ended question and in one of the first interactions that we have with a prospect, it can feel like a lot of effort for them to answer. So this is gonna come in a little bit later when I talk to you guys about the objections themselves. But great question, yes or no questions are not bad, but we want to ask those types of questions before digging into really open-ended questions. Yeah, okay, cool, let's keep rolling. So novelty, and the last thing here uh, that your prospects really want is they want to feel like people oftentimes think they need to ask for the meeting and what your prospect needs to understand before taking a meeting with you is that what they're going to get from it. So your prospects have a desire for insights. So what we need to do is this concept I call teach. Don't take. So instead of selling the meeting and asking for 30 minutes of their time for a call or 15 minutes for an intro call or even five minutes, uh, we need to have something uh, that we promise in return for their time. Like what insights are they going to learn? What are they going to uh, get from that call with us that will be worth their time regardless of if they decide to move forward with your solution or not? Um, so these five desires, I wanted to go through this because this is a really good foundation for what we're about to go through next is that people want autonomy. So we actually need to give the prospect a choice. We can't be really assumptive and like close-ended and like feel like we're forcing them to say yes to something. Our prospects want to feel understood. So we actually have to acknowledge them first. And by doing that, that has a disarming effect because it doesn't matter logically what you say. It could make all the sense in the world about why your solution is better than the competing solution. But if they're not open to hearing about it, it doesn't matter, right? This next part, the desire to be the hero, your prospects want to know how they can win. They don't want to know why you're so awesome at what you do or why your product or solution is so great. And then this fourth part is novelty. So we need to actually do things in a way that make us different from other sales professionals. And lastly, your prospects have a desire for insights. Okay, so um, before we move forward here, I, I just want to know um, which of these five things, like what, what's been most helpful for you so far? Let me know in the chat. Which of these five things has either been most helpful or is something that you're a little bit more curious about? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, Bo says desire to be the hero. Michelle says empathy. Yeah, Michelle uses pattern interrupt all the time. Make them the hero. Novelty, how to share insights, hero Lyle says, yeah, insights, <laughs> Jack says every one of them. Yeah, Satish says, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, insights, Tyler says novelty, cool. All right, I'm just making sure you guys are still alive out there. <laughs> okay, so we're about to get into a little bit more tactical stuff here. So I wanna talk about this loop real quick, and then I'm gonna get your guys' most common objections. I'm gonna help as many of you as I can with your specific objections. Yeah, so Aaron says, what kind of insights do people respond to? Uh, we could talk about this here in a little bit more in depth uh, uh, here later in the session, but the type of insights that they wanna know is like, what are other people like them doing? Um, so Aaron, can you drop in the chat? Uh, what, who are your customers and, and what do you sell to them? I can give you an example. Yeah, drop it in the chat, Aaron. Yeah, CISO, cybersecurity. So that's a really, really great example. 
Um, so insights that you can share are what are other CISOs, like your other clients and their businesses, what is top of mind for them right now when it comes to cybersecurity? What are they thinking about? What are some of the things that you've helped them implement in their business that has helped? Those are things that you can share with your prospects. Yeah, and Lydia says, just for the heck of it, tax accountants, complete CRM. Yeah, so that's like something else, Lydia. Like if you're reaching out to tax accountants or any professional services firms, it's like, hey, what are they doing um, to create more sales? What are they doing to save time and automate their marketing, right? How are they winning in those areas? So Aaron, back to the CISOs. Um, the other thing that you could do too is, is look on like, sites like Deloitte or Forrester, and this is really helpful for any of the other guys as well. Um, look on some of the top consulting uh, websites. Uh, Deloitte's one of them, Forrester is one of them, uh, Garner is another one. They create these really cool third-party insights that you can share with your customers. So you can look up like CISO trends or cybersecurity trends, or if you're selling customer service or customer experience type stuff or HR solutions, or sales or marketing solutions. There's all kinds of like really, really good third-party insights that you can share. Um, cool, awesome. We're gonna keep moving, you guys. Okay, so what I would love to know uh, in the chat here, what's the what's the objection or objections that you're having the toughest time with right now? Let me know in the chat. What are the toughest objections that you're running across right now? Let me know in the chat and we'll work through some of these here. Yeah, so budget, okay. Yeah, not interested. Yeah, timing. These are all pretty normal, by the way, you guys. We got COVID. Yeah, we're all set. <laughs> Talk to me in April. Yeah, that's a really good one. I'm not a cat. <laughs> I don't I don't know what that means, Robert. Yeah, uh, John says you guys are charging too much. Okay. I think this these are some good ones that we can go through. Um, okay, awesome, you guys. So what we're gonna do here is like, if we look at some of these objections, let's look at the not interested one real quick. So the way that this loop works is you have your prospect on this side and then we have you on this side here. So what I want to think, want you to think about is when a prospect gives an objection, like not interested, let's say, in a cold call. Um, how does that make you feel? Oftentimes, when you know, hey, if I'm doing a cold call and I'm like, hey, Jason, this is Jason with Blissful Prospecting, and the person's like, hey, Jason, not interested. A lot of times, what will happen is that might make us feel a little misunderstood. And what I mean by that, yeah, so Jack says it's a brush off. Brian says curious. So when someone says not interested on this side, it can make you feel a little misunderstood because you know what I'm thinking? And let me know in the chat if you've thought this before. When someone says not interested and they cut me off, I'm thinking, how could you not be interested when you don't even know like why I'm calling? Right? Or if someone says uh, budget, and then what you're thinking on your side is like, well, you know, actually my solution can save you a lot of money or it can increase efficiency and you'll get a much better ROI than my competitor, right? And it makes us feel really misunderstood, right? And then Lydia says frustrated, right? That's a really good one, right? Lindsay says complacency. So again, it's like you feel misunderstood because like, why are you so complacent? So what do we end up doing? What do they teach us in sales? They teach us that, hey, when a prospect has an objection, it doesn't really matter like what you feel here, you need to come back with a rebuttal, right? So we come back with a rebuttal when the person says, hey, um, you know, we're happy with our solution. And then we're thinking, well, dude, like, don't you know there's a much better way of doing this? And we come back with a rebuttal and something like, well, hey, that's actually what a customer of mine said six months ago. And they ended up working with us. And what they found is that they were able to do this, this, and this. And I'd love to schedule a 30 minute call with you to tell you more. And what does that make the prospect feel? That makes them feel misunderstood and frustrated. Because what they're thinking is, uh, dude, you cold called me in the middle of my day here. 
can't you see that I already have a solution? Like I am good to go. Like I don't need your stuff. And we get in this loop of person gives us an objection. We feel misunderstood and frustrated. So we come back with a rebuttal, a logical reason. So we attack with logic, why they should still meet with us. And the prospect is thinking the entire time, like, I don't want to talk to you. And it's this battle of like, you basically saying, hey, I'm right, dude. And the prospect saying, no, actually, I'm right. And the way that we can cut this off, and Jack says, yeah, prospects don't act on logic, though. You're 100% correct there, especially when you're objection handling. If there's a lot of tension, they're not going to respond to the logic. They just aren't. Uh, we have to actually disarm them. And the way that we do that, the way that we break this loop is by empathizing with them. So we want to cut this loop off. As soon as we get an objection, we want to cut it off. We don't want to get into this mode where we feel frustrated and misunderstood and come back with a rebuttal and basically saying, hey, you're using my competitor. Well, you're wrong. Like you should be using our stuff instead. We want to break this loop altogether. So here's how we do that. So I want to tactically give you guys some stuff now in terms of like how you can respond. Yeah, Lydia says it's all about emotion at this point in time. 100% correct, Lydia. Um, if you don't acknowledge them emotionally, they're going to be, you know, uh, alarms up, right? They're going to be defensive. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten an argument with a significant other before <laughs> or a spouse, but if you try to attack it with logic, uh, for me, usually anyways, it doesn't usually end up working out that well <laughs> for me. Um, so I have to make sure that the other person feels emotionally like they feel heard. So here's the way that we do that. Um, so let's first look at the shallow objections. So a shallow objection is, hey, not right now, not interested, I'm good. It's not a real objection. They're basically telling you this thing um, to, to get you off the phone. Like they don't want to talk to you. And most people are nice about it. They're not going to say, hey, you're, you're a jerk and I don't want to talk to you right now. Like they're probably not going to say that. So they make up stuff, right? They say things like not interested and that sort of stuff. So what we need to do here is instead of going in for the offer, like going into this with what we want, we actually need to start with what they want and what they need. And there's two things. So we wanna empathize with the prospect and then we wanna validate. And in doing these two things, what it helps us accomplish is disarm the prospect and it helps us be able to dig in a little bit to understand a little bit more about where they're coming from. So hit me in the chat. What do you guys think the person is thinking in their head when you call them and they say not interested? Let's focus on that one first. When the prospects is not interested, to empathize with them, we need to understand a little bit more about what they're thinking and what they're feeling. Yes, yeah, Stephen, this is definitely be recorded and sent out afterwards. So if someone says not interested, you guys hit me in the chat. What do you think that that prospect's thinking? Why do you think that they're saying not interested? What do you think that's on their mind? Yeah, Jack says, oh, another salesperson. Yep. Another salesperson, not a priority. Yep, trying to get you off the phone, <laughs> right? So they could be busy, right? Don't wanna waste time. All the solutions are the same. Okay, all really good stuff. So with empathize, what we want to do is we're going to use a phrase like this. Sounds like. In psychology, they call this labeling. If you've read Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference, he talks about this technique a lot. Uh, he did not come up with the technique necessarily. But essentially what we're going to do is acknowledge where they're coming from, how we think they're feeling, and then we're going to validate. This is a little extra piece. I, I learned this one kind of the hard way in therapy over the last couple of years. So the validate piece is letting them know that how they're feeling is totally okay. And I like to say this, totally understand. So here's how this comes together. So if someone says not interested, I'm gonna say, um, hey, sounds like I might've caught you in the middle of something. I could totally understand if that's the case. And I'm sure the last thing you wanna do is waste any time talking to a salesperson that's trying to pitch you something that you're not interested in. 
any variation of that that we uh, we can say. We just need to empathize with them and acknowledge what they said and let them know that it's okay that they're not interested. A shorter way that you can handle it is this. This is kind of my go-to. Is prospects say, hey, Jason, not interested. Uh, hey, totally hear you. Sounds like I might have caught you in the middle of something. And if that's the case, I could totally understand why now might not be the best time for you to take a call. And in doing this, it has a pretty big disarming effect. Most people are like, ah. I talk about deflating objections with the balloon. When you come back with a rebuttal, you're adding air to the balloon and you're increasing tension. What you wanna do is deflate the balloon. You wanna take air out of the balloon. So when we acknowledge them and then validate, what we're doing has a disarming effect because we're deflating the situation. We're de-escalating the situation. And then we can come in with the offer piece. So I like to use phrases like this. Hey, would it hurt? Would it be a bad idea? And these are those like no oriented questions. So you're asking a question where you're not trying to yes trap the person. And I'll give you an example of a yes trap. So I used to go door to door in college. So this is like 2008 and sell house painting services. In house painting, usually cost somewhere between three and $10,000 uh, US. And when I was presenting the contract, it would sound like this. This is like kind of the weird stuff that they taught us. I'd say, hey, so you want the house, the body of the house painted the same color as the trim, right? Yeah. Oh, and you mentioned that the body, you wanted to make it white, right? Yeah. And I would go down this like list of things just to get like literally like a, maybe a couple dozen yeses from them. And the entire time when I was doing this, it felt really weird. And I could tell the, like the person I was sitting down with is like, dude, like what is wrong with this person? <laughs> you know? Um, so people are really conditioned, your prospects, to these yes traps that salespeople try to do them and they don't want to say yes. So when we ask a question like this, would it hurt? It's a no oriented question. And what we want them to say is, no, that's not a, not a problem at all. Or no, that, no, that's not a bad idea. Or hey, go ahead, right? So what, I'll address your qu uh, question here in a second, Kristen, what I saw it. So let's start from the beginning again. So with not interested, it's gonna sound something like this. Uh, Jason, not interested. Um, hey, totally hear you. Sounds like I might've caught you in the middle of something here. Um, and if that's the case, I could totally understand why now might not be the best time to take a call. Uh, but would it hurt? Because I, I did some research on you. And I feel like we might be able to help you out. Would it hurt if I took 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling and then you could let me know if you wanna keep chatting? And most of the time, eight or nine times out of 10, I've listened to thousands of call recordings and, and made lots of these calls myself. Eight or nine times out of 10, the person's like, okay, go ahead. And Kristen asked a question in the chat. What happens if they say, no, I'm really not interested. It's not a timing issue. Um, then you might let it go. Once you try to handle the objection one time and the person says, well, actually, no, I'm, I'm really just like, this is not a good fit. It's a timing issue. That's okay. I don't know about you, I wouldn't wanna waste any time with that person in the sales process because I would be wasting their time too. So that's totally okay. So these shallow objections, um, not right now. Uh, Jason, you caught me in the middle of something. Hey, man, uh, sounds like you're pretty busy. And like you said, I caught you in the middle of something. So I could totally understand if now is not the best time to talk. Uh, but while I have you on the phone, I mean, would it be a bad idea to just take uh, just a minute or so to tell you why I'm calling? And then you could let me know if you know it makes sense now to talk or later, or, or maybe not even at all, because it's not relevant, boom. And then you go like that. So those are those shallow objections. Uh, before we move on to some different objections, I'd love to hear with you in the chat. Um, what about uh, that I shared just now was helpful for you? So if you're getting these types of objections, let me know in the chat. What about uh, the process that I went through just now? What can you take away and actually use? I wanna make sure this is actionable for you. Yeah, no orientation, Paul says. Kevin likes the flow. It's very conversational. Yeah, the yes trap thing. Lydia says value for their time. Yep. Yeah, Aaron, that's a really great one. Yeah, you're you're sharing a permission-based opener there, you know, when you call people. And just so you guys know too, a lot of you are chatting me directly, the panelist. If you click panelists and attendees, other people can see your questions as well. Yeah, good flow, need to be on the top of your game to have the 30 second pitch ready. 
Yeah, definitely. So Jack asked another question here. How do we come up with the responses you're using? They are really good, but roll off your tongue rather well. Uh, practice, just like anything else. Um, you guys are going to get a replay of this webinar. I would suggest listening back to it. Um, we also have boot camps too. You know, so if you want some extra help, man, like working through this stuff, that's a way to get help as well. Uh, Kevin says it's very non-confrontational. Yeah, like I really want to lean in and be curious. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, Michelle uses another cold call opener that I love. Giving an out seems to help. Hey, what if I heard if I took a minute to let you know why I'm calling? And if it doesn't make sense for us to continue, I'll stop calling. So it's just practice. Um, this empathize part. So here, let's go into a different one. Um, let's say it's someone that's already set. So there's a couple different phrases and techniques that you can use. Let's say someone's already set because they have a vendor already, or maybe they do it themselves. Uh, Michael asked about the cost of the boot camp. Um, I'll get to that that at the end, Mike. We'll, I'll be able to answer any questions that you guys have about the boot camp. Um, great question. Um, we'll definitely cover that at the end here in about ten minutes. Um, so if someone's already set, what you need to do is like really lean in and be genuinely curious. So if someone says already set, like I'm good to go, I don't know about you, like I'm actually really curious like how they might be handling it. Not so that I can rebuttal and like tell them that my stuff is better, but I'm really curious as to like what they might be doing. So there's a couple techniques you can use here. So one of them, this is a little bit more of an advanced technique. This is something that Chris Voss talks a lot about. Again, he didn't come up with it necessarily, but it's been very popularized in the sales world. So when someone says I'm already set, what are they probably thinking? The person's probably thinking, uh, dude, uh, I already have a solution in place. Why would I want to continue talking to someone that might disrupt my current process? Like, I'm good to go. So we're going to do a couple different things. One, you can mirror. And mirroring is just repeating the last couple words that they say back to them. And it's going to sound really funky. It's going to feel really funky when you do it, too, the first couple times. This is something you can practice in your in your uh, real life, in your personal life as well. So if someone says, uh, hey, Jason, thanks, man, but we're already set. I'm just going to repeat those words back to them and say, oh, you're already set? And I need to be genuinely curious. That's the key here. What will take care of your tonality and how conversational you are is when someone says already set, you lean in and you're like, oh, awesome. Like, sounds like this person's got something on the ball. They might already be doing something. I'm really curious what that might be. That's the tonality that you're going to come in with. So if someone says, hey, we're we're actually using one of your competitors, A, B, and C. Oh, you're using one of our competitors, A, B, and C? And what that's going to usually do is get them talking. Yep. Uh, Jack mentions a really, really good point here in the chat. When you are curious, you may find out that the prospect isn't exactly using a similar service or product. They may think they do, but it may not be the case. I actually ran into that. I'm doing a sales call later today with a client, a prospect that I'm trying to do, you know, a, a training program with, to help them with their prospecting. And she thought they're already taken care of because they're using a couple of other vendors helping with a different thing, more around the sales process and not around the prospecting and the outbound process. So Jack brings up a really good point there. So here's what we're gonna do. So if someone's like, hey, you know, I'm already set, we're doing this, or hey, we take care of it ourselves, we can mirror and say, oh, you're taking care of it yourselves? How's that going for you? Right? Or you could just repeat the last couple of words back and see what they say. Now, the validate piece, again, I'm just like talking to what I think that they're already like thinking. Um, hey, I'm sure what you're probably thinking is, you know, hey, if we already have a process in place, like why would we want to entertain like another way of doing things if it's already working? I'm just going to call out what they're thinking. Or, hey, it sounds like you got a process in place. And I, I'm sure, you know, the last thing you would want to do is like waste your time talking to someone like me. Um, if you already have a process in place that's like already working, you don't want to break, break it. Any variation of that, you guys, like um, I'm kind of winging these parts a little bit. The exact words you use are not as important as you actually empathizing with the person and then validating. And there's another uh, phrase that I like to use that's pretty good is you could say, this might be a long shot. So person's like, hey, we're already set. I'm like, oh, you're already set? They're like, yeah, you know, we're using uh, A, B, and C solution. Uh, we actually really like it. We've been working with them for two or three years now. 
hey, sounds like you're taken care of. Um, and I could totally understand if, you know, what you're thinking is why would I want to entertain doing something else if I'm pretty happy with my current solution? And you know what, uh, Jack, you know, this might be a long shot, but we happen to work with a lot of businesses like yours. And what we find them doing to fix these problems is A, B, and C. Uh, would it hurt if I at least just shared some of those things with you? And if nothing else, you might have some stuff that you could bring back to your current vendor. And then get them to talk, right? And that's where you can bring in some of those insights. Uh, so it's 1044. I think we got time to go through another one here. So let's look at COVID because that's like a really hot topic right now. So with COVID, again, what we're going to do is think about if the person says, hey, like we're going through COVID right now, like things are super hectic, the budget's frozen, all that stuff, like I really want to empathize with them. So think about what it's like if you were a leader in a company or a VP or C-level or whoever it is you're trying to get a hold of, and business is really tough right now due to COVID. It's got to be stressful, right? And the last thing that they want to do is like waste time or waste money on something that isn't a for sure thing. So let's just acknowledge that. Uh, so again, we can use the mirroring technique. So if they say, hey, you know, COVID, um, you know, COVID is, you know, really impacting us right now. And like, we've had to lay off people and all this other stuff. Um, what we can do is like mirror, oh, you've had to lay off a bunch of people or, oh, hey, your budgets are frozen. And then get them talking. And then we need to acknowledge like how that might feel. Right. Oh, your budgets are frozen. Yeah. You know, um, it's just, it's, it's been tough for us. I've had to lay people off. I'm like, oh man, that's just sounds like a bummer. And I imagine that's really stressful for you. So I totally understand if like, you know, now isn't the time that you're talking to like new vendors or people like me about like implementing new tools or technology or services or anything like that. And Hey, this might be a long shot, but we are working with a lot of companies like yours and uh, you know, would it hurt if I shared some of the things that they're doing right now um, to like really get through COVID in the best way possible? And if nothing else, it'll give you some ideas that you can use and then you can decide if another conversation makes sense. Cool. All right. So that's how we can handle like COVID stuff. I, I want to pause here in the chat. Is there something you guys want me to dig into a little bit more around objections? Are you guys getting some good stuff here? Like, let, let me know in the chat. Is there something that you personally want me to dig into a little bit more around shallow objections, someone that's already got a solution in place, COVID? Let me know in the chat. Webinars are always interesting because I can't see you guys. <laughs> so um, I always like to check in here. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff, Joe says. Lisa says great stuff. Any questions that you guys have? Let me dig through the Q&A here, actually. So Lydia says, I'm just wondering if I might be more effective to say, would it be a good idea to blank because we want a yes? Where I feel like asking, would it be a bad idea? Let's them say yes and shut you down right there. Um, yeah, Lydia, I kind of went through the no-oriented questions. Um, I find that when you allow the person uh, and say, would it be a bad idea? Would it hurt when you go for the no? It just It's just a little easier for them to respond to. I use this every day in my personal life too. Like if I'm trying to get people to do something, I say, hey, would it hurt if we at least explored like that restaurant and looked up the Yelp reviews? And if nothing else, we can make sure we're not missing out on anything. Like any of that like type of stuff works really, really well. Um, so Lydia, great question. Hopefully, hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, okay. So Lori says, if I think that we had a nice dialogue, I asked permission if we could connect again. Yeah, Loria, uh, so really good. So if you had a good dialogue with the person or just like, you know what, actually just COVID, we're not doing anything right now. Um, what I would do is like say, hey, um, I have some really helpful information that I'd love to email to you. Uh, is it cool if I email you this, this, and this? Awesome. And then you can ask for permission to keep the, the dialogue going. You know, what do you feel like is going to change between now and the next three months? And then what you can do is like really get a good idea of like, hey, what would be helpful for you right now? Like, what kind of challenges are you running across right now? So that's a way that you can handle that, Lori. I like your idea there, asking permission to connect again. But I would like nurture the person in the meantime. 
Yeah, Henry says, how do I respond to send more information? So again, I'm thinking, what's the person thinking? That's kind of like a not interested objection. Um, hey, sounds like uh, totally understand, uh, Henry. I, you know, I imagine one of the last things you, you probably want to do is like waste a bunch of time meeting with someone like me if I'm talking about stuff that's not relevant for you. So if I if I could, um, is there anything that I could include in that information that would be relevant to challenges or anything like that that you're working on right now? And then get them to like really lean in and talk about some of the stuff that's going on for them right now. And you can objection handle around that as well. Okay, so Stephen asks, is your overall goal of the call to set up a subsequent meeting for a deeper dive? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but prior to that, you need to start a conversation. So get a conversation going, talk through some of these objections. And then what you can do is see if it makes sense for you to actually do another meeting with someone as well. Um, really good questions, you guys. Yeah, Lydia says, I ask if I can add them to my newsletter list. That's a really good one. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think we answered most of the questions, you guys. Okay, so what I want to do now here, let me let me reshare my screen here. Okay. Here we go. Okay, what I'd love to know from you guys in the chat um, where do you feel like when it comes to objection handling, where do you personally, let me know in the chat, where do you feel like you need to improve the most? Let me know in the chat. Paul says verbiage. Yeah, not being shut down by strong reactions. That's a tough one, Henry. Yeah, having the answers readily available, Jack says. Yeah, the responses, Michelle says. Tamara seconds Henry. <laughs> Confidence, Lexi says. Yeah, the first three sentences, Stephen says. Confidence. Yeah, being audible ready. And can you guys see the slides again? Just give me a quick yes. And Okay, cool. Yeah, Keo says quick reaction. Confidence. I'm hearing a lot of confidence. Making my responses more reflexive so I don't have to think about it, right? Getting some reps in. Yeah, John wants to know how to handle call me next week. Yeah, Varud says, you know, the feeling of being a pain. I'm seeing confidence a lot too. So very normal stuff, you guys. Um, I'd also love to hear from you, like with objections specifically, um, how do you feel like improving this area would improve like the next 30 days for you? Like if you were to get better at, in this area, what do you think the impact would be for you in the next 30 days? So if you got more confident, had better ways of handling objections, like what do you guys think would be the impact for you? Yeah, Lindsay says more meetings. Kevin says huge <laughs> in all caps. Um, yeah, not looking salesy, Satish says. That's a big one for me. I don't want to feel salesy. Tamara says more meetings, more pipeline, Kevin says. Making more calls, Kyra says. Yeah, Kevin says pipeline. Yeah, being more empathetic, Vin says. Eliminate time wasters, John says. That's a really big one. Yeah, pipeline, Alejandro says. Yeah, picking up the phone and dialing. So call reluctance, it sounds like for some of you guys is a big thing. Um, cool. So what I'm gonna talk to you guys about now is the prospecting bootcamp. So this is that time where I said like, hey, if you're just here for the free stuff, like that's all good. Um, if you want a little bit of extra support, um, I'm gonna let you know a little bit more about the prospecting bootcamp. Um, for those of you that wanna take off right now, the recording and stuff is gonna get sent out to you like probably later today or tomorrow. But if you want a little bit more information about the boot camp and how you can get more help with this stuff and other things related to outbound, um, tune in. Cool. Yeah, you bet, you guys. Um, so the boot camp is really centered around uh, these challenges. So if you're having challenges around like, hey, I get analysis paralysis and trying to find good fit companies and the right job titles, that's something I hear a lot, like a targeting kind of thing. Um, if you're writing cold emails right now and it takes really long for you to write them and the response rates are low, like maybe two, 3% or lower. Maybe you're building a sequence or cadence and it's a lot of work and it's not creating repeatable results. Or maybe you don't have a sequence or cadence at all right now. Uh, maybe you know, like you should be personalizing the outreach, but like that whole process takes a really long time. Uh, a couple of you mentioned this in the chat. Maybe you have call reluctance that keeps you from picking up the phone and you kind of like hiding behind email and LinkedIn messages. And we talked a lot about objections today, but you know, maybe you freeze up when a prospect gives you objections and it's really tough you know, to like answer on the spot, know exactly what you want to say, and then feel confident at the same time. 
So here are some of the things that we help with in the boot camp. Um, so we're going to help you figure out and know exactly what companies are the perfect fit for your product or service. Um, I have a process where I help streamline the cold emails that you're sending so you can get double digit reply rates. Uh, we help you build a sequence and cadence so you know the right combination of like emails, calls, social touches to create more repeatability for you. Uh, we walk through personalization as well. So what to look for specifically when you're personalizing your emails so that you don't end up wasting a bunch of time. Uh, call reluctance is a big thing we talk about. So giving you a good structure for cold calls. A lot of you, it looks like have a lot of meetings that you feel like you're missing out on on a monthly basis. And a lot of that I found is related to the phone. So picking up the phone and being able to do well there. And then also feeling confident handling objections. So this is the content we cover. How to find the perfect fit prospect in module one. We talk about the reply method. So we got a whole week where we talk about cold emails. We talk about sequencing. There's a whole section on cold calling, objections, how to scale. I mean, there's just a ton of content that you get access to. And the way that it works is like this. And, and feel free, you guys, as I'm going through this, if you have any questions in the chat, let me know. Um, so the way it works in the boot camp is it's six weeks. And during that six-week period, you actually get lifetime access to course content. So you get to keep that forever. You don't have to keep paying for that or anything. But you're going to get access to course content that I update on a monthly basis that's got all kinds of stuff in there. It's got scripts, worksheets, templates, you know, videos, live training calls. Um, there's group Q&A calls as well. So uh, twice per week, we run group, group calls. You can hop on one of those or both of those if you want. Uh, but you get to ask me questions in those calls. So if you want help uh, with like your specific objections or cold calling or whatever it might be, we definitely cover that. And Kevin asks, is the boot camp once a week or every day? Yeah, it's once per week. And the times of the calls are Tuesdays at 2.30 p.m. PT or Thursday. I'm going to drop this in the chat at 7 a.m. PT and they're 90 minutes, you don't have to attend the entire call. You can just come to the call and get what you need and take off. So you don't need to, to, to spend time on the entire call. They're really just to help you troubleshoot and answer your questions and get direct access to me. And you also get direct access to like a community of people too. So there's a bunch of folks like you on these calls and you get to kind of game plan and brainstorm together. And then lastly, like I said, you get access to all the scripts, worksheets, templates, all kinds of stuff around there too. Um, so this also works for, and I wanted to mention Nicole here because the, the person I mentioned before, Joel, he sells software, uh, Nicole sells insurance. So one of the things that, uh, she really got from the boot camp was the accountability piece and like having a community and then also putting herself in the shoes of the prospect to increase her response rate. So if you're selling services, um, this will work too. So anything software services, you know, physical products, like anything that involves like prospecting to other businesses. This would be a good fit for you. And then Jack asks, uh, hey, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I'm working with a partner who has a service in which they may uh, want help. I'm not sure when they'll be able to flip the switch and go. I can sign up anytime. Yep. Yeah, you can sign up at any time. We're running the boot camp year round. Um, so here's how you can get more info. So um, I can get more like specifics to you. Someone asked about pricing. Uh, the bootcamp is 999 bucks for the six weeks, or you can do three payments of 350. So those are three monthly payments. That's the pricing just to be transparent with you guys. And if you want more information, I can send you specifics. So if you want to see more testimonials, uh, we got tons of video case studies on there. And just maybe you want some more insight on the program or have questions for me, feel free to either ask them in the chat or you can actually text me directly. So there's the number right there. I'll drop it into the chat. 436-0615. Yep, text that number and put bootcamp in there and I can get you information and we'll get you taken care of. Um, so I see there's a bunch of you guys on the call still. Um, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone feel like, hey, this is something I really wanna do. I wanna join you. Does anyone feel like you have questions or anything else like that that I can help you with? Hit me in the chat. I'll give you guys a minute or two. Let me know if you got any questions or anything like that. Yeah, so Kevin, the boot camp, we run the boot camp year round. So we have calls going right now. Uh, if you signed up this week, you could get started next week. So that's, that's how quickly you could get started. 
Uh, yeah, so Michelle says, are the lessons pre-recorded with weekly assignments? We have pre-recorded lessons and there are weekly assignments. And then you get to come on live in a group call and ask questions. So that's where during that hour and a half period, once a week, you'll get direct access to me. You get to ask me questions. Let Lay says, this is ongoing. Yep, this is an ongoing thing. So you can join at any time. Yeah, how long does the bootcamp take all in all? Joanna says, great question. Um, what I suggest is spending two to three hours on the content between the content and the calls. So the calls are 90 minutes. Again, you don't have to show up for the entire call. You can just show up and get what you need from the calls. But I do recommend that you spend an hour or two on top of that, like going through the content and actually working through the lessons. So you really need to dedicate like three hours a week to it. An hour to 90 minutes of that is going to be structured probably in the Tuesday or Thursday call. So hopefully that answers your question, Joanna. Um, any other questions? Let me know in the chat. How many weeks? So the boot camp is six weeks. So you get six weeks of calls, but you get lifetime access to the course content. So you're always going to have access to the community and the course content if you sign up. Uh, yep. Yeah, Michelle. So right now the online community is in the course uh, forum. We're actually launching a Slack community as well, uh, but that's probably going to be in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, we definitely have a community of people, especially like on the calls in the course community that you can engage with. Great question, Michelle. Uh, Kevin Gordon asked, what material do we get or is it all online? Uh, it's all online. Yeah, you don't need any printed material. Um, all of the prospecting that we do is digital, right? It's it's through the phone, it's through email, it's through LinkedIn. So there's no physical stuff that you need. It's all online. It's pr pretty seamless, pretty easy. Great question, Kevin. Um, oops. And I know we got a bunch more people on the call still. So let me know if you guys got questions. And then shoot me a text at that number with bootcamp. If you want some more information, I can send, I can send the rest of the stuff to you. And I can stay along, I can stay on for another couple of minutes if anyone has any other questions. Yeah, you bet, Lindsay. Yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes here if I see anything come in. Who got anything else, you guys? Yep, Joanna, where can you get more info? Uh, send a text. You can see it on the screen. Send send a text to that number, and I'll and I'll uh, uh, get you. Uh, I'll I'll uh, message you directly back to get you some more information. So, Jana, send me a text at this number on the screen. I'll throw it into the chat again. Uh, Kevin. So, yeah, it is U.S. dollars. Uh, why don't you reach out to me, Kevin? Um, we aren't running any specials right now, but reach out to me, man. Um, we might be able to hook you up. So yeah, if you guys want to email me directly, you can do that too. Just put bootcamp in the subject line. I'll drop my email in there. It's jason at blissfulprospecting.co for you, Lay. So either text me there or send me an email. I'm happy to get you guys more information. Any other questions? You guys good? Yeah. Yeah, you bet, Brian. Cool. Awesome, Kevin. So Kevin sent me a text. Yeah, let me know, you guys, if you have any other questions I can help you with. Otherwise, I can help you through text or, or through email. Yeah, you bet, Joanna. Thanks for all your patience today, you guys, with the technical difficulties, too. That's that's always fun to deal with. Um, cool. All right, you guys. I'm going to hop off. Thank you for spending an hour with me today. Hopefully, you got a ton of value on the objections, and I hope to see some of you guys in the boot camp. We'll see ya. Later.